to all my questions. Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, once again we come before your awesome throne and we thank you for the great privilege uh, always to come before you and we thank you also for the revelation of your character through your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we understand that that revelation was not given in vain but it was given to show to your people, well, first to speak to our minds concerning the great controversy, but also to show us that we can also live victoriously through Christ as he has done. And may we understand that that victorious life of Christ is ours when we believe it by faith. And I pray, Father, that, that faith is given to us to accept that blessed truth so that uh, we can receive power from on high to uh, be sanctified and cleansed through your word. These mercies we ask through your son's wonderful name. Amen. Amen. All right, good night and welcome to another Wednesday night prayer meeting. And we are still continuing in the chapter, chapter 11, Go Try the Fire, part two. And we saw in part one and following into this chapter, the necessity of the trial and the test that we receive. And remember that the book is called The True Church Prepares for Her Final Conflict. Uh, and we know that we cannot be, we cannot fool ourselves. And I think Sister White said it very well. She said, if we're not uh, enduring the tests and trials now and overcoming them, she says, let us not fool ourselves and think that when that final uh, test and trial comes, that we will be able to pass it. We should be at this time learning to trust God. And remember that, as A.T. Jones says, that cultivating faith really means making a habit to trust the Word of God. And it does when it says making a habit to trust the Word of God, these are things that are to be seen. Because I can believe by faith that Abraham has done that the Lord was able to reckon this through Abraham or reckon this through Christ. But we are to make it a habit to trust God by acting upon his promises and moving forward. And that is how the people of God are to operate, acting upon the promises of God. Otherwise, remember, uh, the will of God will not be accomplished in our lives. Remember, Sister White says that the act of the expulsion of sin from the soul is the act of the soul itself. And we are to believe by faith that the life of Christ is the same life that is given to us. And Jesus says to us, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And since he's spoken that word unto us, we are to accept it if it is to have uh, any effect in our life. And accepting it means not only bringing it in uh, to the mind, but also allowing it to transform us in character. So last week we would have left off and on page 125 of this book, The True Church Prepares for a Final Conflict, and he was saying, he was clearing up some things on the character of God and saying that these are things that the people of God must know, especially at this time, because if, he said, if God allows uh, a believer to die or suffers ill health or misfortune, many people conclude that the only reason for his suffering, for the person suffering, is the presence of unbelief or hidden sin or both. And this is a, a false theory that was held by the Jews who thought that if you were going through suffering or sickness, that you were the curse of God. And Jesus came and showed that that was not the case at all. It is, uh, and you had many people down through the ages, Job, Ledger, all these people who would have gone through their texts and their trials, and it was not because they were at all wicked, but the Lord was actually sanctifying and purifying them. And this is why Peter says that we are to rejoice for these things. We are to be glad. If we are not seeing these tests and trials, uh, then we should not be glad because of that. We should uh, seriously be seeing that because 
it shows that God loves us, as Paul says, and that he treats us as sons and not as bastards. So I just want to continue. And uh, as I said before, the chapter is pretty lengthy, but by the Spirit of God, we will get through it as a Lord would have us to. So he says, while such serious error is maintained, it is impossible for God to truly achieve his deep, wonderful, and yet mysterious purpose in the believers who consequently fail to enter into his rest. Losses, sufferings, and bereavement for which their belief provides no place will confuse and trouble them, leading them to doubt the goodness, mercy, and love of their Heavenly Father they will feel that he is working against them, not for them, that he is not a covenant-keeping God, and that he makes promises and does not keep them. Until this problem is solved by the correction of this erroneous thinking, true peace and rest will not be found by God's children. And remember what the Apostle Paul, and there's a text we know very well, Romans 8, 28, and we know, and Paul says, and we know. So Paul is implying that this is something that we should know concerning who our God is. It says, and we know that all things work together for good for them that are the call according to his purpose. And that is what we are to understand. Romans 8, 28. Let me uh, not misquote it. Romans 8, 28. Yeah, sorry. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And remember that this eternal purpose, it is beautiful when you read the book of Romans, you see that Paul is really building up to introducing this eternal purpose, which he says was hid from all eternity. We're showing the ultimate purpose of God and he's saying that all these things that we go through is for the perfect revelation of this eternal purpose of God. Because as we discussed last week, that there are many people who are confounded that a God of infinite love could allow such a world on his hands. And <coughs> God has been constantly revealing himself to us. And in Christ, he uh, made who he was what his government was about completely through his son. And therefore we understand that it is for the accomplishment of the eternal purpose of God, which is to have man fully reflect God in character. Because if, as a people, we allow tests and trials to shake us, to move us out of our submission from Christ, it shows that we have not allowed the love of God to perfect us. Because when we look in the life of Christ, we see that, and how God operates, that God does not allow, quote unquote, emergencies or certain situations to shake him with. God, when the same problem came in, even though Sister White describes it as God having to meet a terrible emergency, God had a plan for it from eternity, and there was never any worry in God. And he's saying to us, now we may say, well, God knows everything, so obviously nothing can come as an emergency or any worry to him. But God is saying, when you are abiding in the eternal God, who knows everything from the end to the beginning, why do you have to worry about anything? When we are trusting in God, we know that all things work together according to his will, for that purpose. So therefore, we must let Christ uh, stand upon the word of God and allow nothing to shake us. And this is why now you understand why Paul finishes chapter 8 the way that he does. He says, from verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Nor, sorry, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the only thing that can have us set and established in Christ is when we have a knowledge of who he is. Because uh, as he says here, as he ends this um, paragraph, he says, until this problem of understanding who God is is solved by the correction of this erroneous thinking, true peace and rest will not be found by God's children. So unless this true, the true concept of the eternal purpose of God and the character of God is made clear to our minds, there can be no eternal peace or rest come to our minds. And God is saying, it is for this reason that I sent my son to reveal myself to you so that peace and joy can come unto you. And this is why when Christ was born, it says peace and goodwill to all men. That was the uh, purpose of God. And Jesus, God, what did God say in the Old Testament? He said that I don't have thoughts of evil towards you, but there are thoughts of peace and to give you an expected end. There are always the thoughts of love towards us, always the thoughts of uh, making more perfectly known his will and having that accomplished in us. God has been seeking, and it seems weird, you may think that God may be one who is striving for attention, seeking to always uh, reveal himself to us, but that is not the case. He understands, as Sister White says in Desire of Ages, page 22, that the world was darkened through a misapprehension of God. And God knows that unless we have an accurate knowledge of who he is, we are actually walking in darkness. And he says, I do not want you to walk in darkness. I sent Christ, who is the light of all men, who is the light of life, to come before you. And for those who sat in the region of darkness, they will see great light and not just see it, but allow, but to walk in that light and allow it to transform them. And this is the purpose of God revealing himself to bring us from the darkness of the errors which Satan have caused us to believe and now for us to accept his truth and to live perfectly in his sight. And it is this truth on God's character that allow Adam and Eve to live perfectly in his sight uh, for however long they did before they rebelled. And, and as the worst position is that uh, he doesn't believe that Adam and Eve uh, sinned again after the first transgression. And I, that is my belief as well, because I think that they would have seen the love of God to such an extent when they saw what Christ would have to do, because God gave to Adam an understanding of the plan of salvation and what God would have to do for the human race. And through the sacrificial services of the Lamb, it was to show that God would send his only son to die for the world so that the world may have life. And it is this knowledge of God's character, of the plan of salvation, that would have uh, so motivated Adam and Eve to remain true in their submission to God. And it is this character, when revealed to us in, and to our minds, that has allowed us also to remain true to God in our submission to him. All right, continuing. It is true that God is all-loving and all-powerful and that he does not wish to see his children suffer and die. He wants a living company of believers through whom he can finish the work, and eventually he will have such a group. But in the meantime, it is not a question of what God wants, but of what the great controversy demands. The simple fact is that the battle of the ages cannot be won without sacrificial suffering by all of God's children. This will vary in degree from case to case, depending on the circumstances and the needs arising from them. For some of God's children, John the Baptist, Lazarus, and the martyrs being prime examples, the sacrifice has to be total. If a believer is not willing to give all that the controversy demands, then the ultimate victory for the cause is delayed and time extended. The presence of adversity and suffering in Paul's life did not disturb his peace for a moment. Understanding God's character and his working, he recognized that they occupied an essential place in his service to God and his fellow men. 
He knew their value in developing Christian experience and the nature of the witness he could give only under these conditions. He knew that he was afforded a privilege which not even the angels had. Therefore, he not only accepted these trials restfully, but actually rejoiced under suffering. This attitude will be shared by all who enter into God's Sabbath rest. So therefore, Paul understood that it was not about what God wanted. Paul understood that it was what the controversy demanded. And how did we know that Paul understood that? Paul, in Philippians 1.29, uh, makes this statement. He understood what it was about. Philippians 1 and verse 29. The Apostle Paul says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So Paul understood that what the controversy demanded uh, because of the issues involved, that suffering would have been an inevitable result for those who walk in the way of Christ. And it was through this suffering that the people of God were to reveal to the entire earth and, well, to the entire universe, including the unfallen worlds, the manifold wisdom of God, the very character of of God himself. And Paul outlines this in Ephesians 3, 10, and 11. Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, starting with verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul understood that what we were going through was for the means of answering the questions in the great controversy. It was providing what the controversy demands. And remember that as we saw, Satan had laid some charges against God's government, and it was for the people of God. It was for God to answer these charges through first through Christ and then by his people. So God gave the clearest demonstration of who he was, cleared all the charges that Satan laid against God's government. But the world, the majority of the world, does not know. Remember that, as Dr. Duggan would have mentioned in the series back in 2006, that God had opened the eyes of the unformed worlds and had shown them uh, what it really was, and Satan was cast out from heaven, cast down, because his influence was no longer with those in heaven, it, their sympathies with him were forever uh, disconnected. But Satan still has some sympathizers down here. And the question, well, the question that we should ask for ourselves is if we're still sympathizing with him uh, based on our reaction in our daily life to the tests and trials that we receive. But he still has sympathizers down here. And it is for this reason that God needs us as his people who say that we understand who he is to reveal this truth. Because of, as long as the truth of God, as, as to who he is, is concealed from this world, uh, those all in the world, and including us, will continue to be sympathizers with his government. Because remember, as quoted, Romans 1, verse 17, that Paul says that there are people who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And if we hold the truth concerning God's character in unrighteousness, we are rarely sympathizers with Satan as those who do not know the truth in his character. So we must be allowing this truth to sanctify us and allow it to be revealed in us uh, for answering the questions in the great controversy. He continues. 
that these principles are clearly revealed in the story of Job. If there was an occasion when Satan, as prince of this world, presented himself at a council meeting of the sons of God, Jehovah appealed to him to explain how Job's perfect obedience fit in with Satan's claim that the law could not be kept by created beings. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and assureth evil? And this is Job 1, 6 to 8. It was in love for Satan. <laughs> Interesting. It is in love for Satan that God addressed him thus. The evil one consistently argued that the law of God could not be kept, and it was not made for man's blessing and benefit, but was a yoke of bondage designed to chain all created beings to the, the, to the despotic will of God. Now, you see the contrast? God, he says here, it is in love for Satan that God addressed him thus. And God was actually, when you look in Job 1, God is bringing charges against God's government because he told God, listen, Job is only serving you because you give him this and you give him that and you put a hedge around him. And it's saying that God actually bribes his creatures for his worship. Saying that God is, is so selfish that he would do all these things just to get worship to himself. And it's just, it reminds me of when Sister White says that Satan has placed his attributes upon God. And if God is actually in love for Satan, addressing him thus, while well, Satan is actually in contrast, uh, talking down on God's government and making it look as though it is this oppressive and selfish government. He says, before Satan's rebellion, rebellion, God's ways had never been challenged. Now that they were, peace could not return to the universe until the issues were resolved to everyone's complete satisfaction. And though, the, though before his rebellion, uh, though now, sorry, after his rebellion, that the, God's ways were challenged, did that cause God to at all lose his peace? No. God was 100% at peace. And it is because he is a God of love who allows absolute freedom in his government. He knew very well that in creating free creatures that su such things could happen. That you would have a being who is now ch challenging the way of God and essentially challenging the way of life. And God uh, set out that this issue would have to be resolved. He says, until the issues were resolved to everyone's complete satisfaction. As this could not be done by declaration alone, the nature of the controversy demanded that a demonstration be given by someone living not in the perfect environment of paradise, but in this sinful world, Job was such a man. Now, for the people of God, the word of God should be sufficient for us to rest our faith upon, to rest our hope in. But realize that God is God is the God of infinite wisdom, and he understands that for beings, for us, he has not only just by declaration to say, well, even though it is true of uh, who, he, who he is, he must show it and must demonstrate it. So God could not by de declaration alone, uh, make this clear, but he said the nature of the controversy demanded that a demonstration be given by someone living not in the perfect environment of paradise, but in this simple world. Job was such a man. So God, in God does everything really uh, by demonstration, and by that, that when He spoke, everything comes in to existence. So he demonstrates the power of his word when he speaks it and things come in to existence. And as Michael Carr says that when it came to Christ, 
God spoke his final word and sent forth Christ to be that answer, to answer the questions in the great controversy. So when God speaks, he's actually both declaring and demonstrating who he is all in one. And that is why the word of God can never return void because it has the full weight of the power of God behind it. Right. He says, the faithful patriarch was serving God under conditions far more difficult than those experienced by dwellers in the sinless realms. Daily harassed by temptations and handicapped by weak, fallen, sinful, mortal flesh, Job continually witnessed to the, to the certainty that God's law was made for the blessing and protection of all his creatures. So what was God's law made for? For the blessing and protection of all his creatures. So was it made to oppress us, as many suggest? No, it was made for the blessing and protection of all his creatures. And it gives you a deeper understanding of what Paul says when he says that the law of God was added because of transgression. It was not added uh, because God knew how to make clear that there was a law and that y'all need to keep it. It was added so as for man to truly experience liberty in Christ. And it will seem funny that the way that the law is stated, you will wonder, well, how could there be any liberty in that? When God is telling you, do this and do that. But God is actually showing us that this is his new covenant. This is the promise of God to keep us from sin, showing to us that sin is what actually brings us into bondage, and it is obedience to the law of God in the heart that brings ultimate freedom. And there is no freedom in outward, understand what I'm saying, in trying to keep the law outwardly. You know, there are people that say that there is a blessing that comes when you do this and you do that. But unless there has, the, the law of God is first in the heart and in the mind, and has freed that believer from sin in their mind, there has been no liberty that has been yet experienced by that believer. So you have us as Adventists who always say, well, we have the Sabbath and we are truly God's children. But God's children are free. And so the children of Israel is interesting. The children of Israel in the days of Christ says that we be not in bondage to any man, but they were in bondage to the Roman government. God is saying that my children are always absolutely and completely free. And remember that they were in every situation where they were in bondage, whether it was to Rome or whether it was to Babylon or any other empire, that, Babylon, that um, bondage was because of their disobedience, because of their lack of experiencing the law of God in their hearts. And God is saying to us that he wants us now to experience this truth so that we can have liberty uh, through him. He says, therefore, when God directed Satan to consider Job's obedience, he was asking him what further proof he needed to end the argument, making no attempt to deny his own form of obedience or that of the sinless angels and other fallen beings still are to God. Satan conceded that Job was obedient. It is true that Job obeys you, but it is not for nothing, was his rejoinder. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job, the Sorry, the Job fear God or not? Hast thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and it will curse thee to thy face. Job 1, 9, 10, and 11. Here, Satan precisely spelled out his position which was not, as one might expect that a law cannot be kept at all, but, it, but that it can be kept only under limited circumstances. Satan argued that, Satan argued that, favored by prosperity and protection, Job could and did keep the commandments. But if those conditions were changed to adversity and suffering, Job would also change to wickedness. This is the message continually projected through works of fiction where the good obey the law, until they believe it must be broken in order to destroy the evildoer. So this reflects 
uh, the mindset of many, not realizing that they're echoing the sentiments of the enemy, saying that, uh, that it is only under certain conditions that obedience can be rendered to God. And it is no different from a child in a classroom or in or before their parents' presence. They will behave good in the teacher's presence or in their parents' presence. But when uh, that guardian is absent, then they will uh, dis display a behavior different from that. And really and truly, if that is being said about God's children, you know what it is saying about God? That God also puts on a front. That God makes himself look as though he is this nice and loving person. And then on the other side of it, uh, he's completely different. So in reality, our lives will either vindicate the, char the character and government of God or will speak badly about God's government and his, about his character and his government. And remember that Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 3, he says that, In verse 2, he says, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So the epistles of God, what is their purpose? What do they serve? The entire word of God serves to tell us about who God is. So therefore, since Paul is saying now that we are the epistles of Christ, it means that we are also to serve as do the scriptures to tell the world about who God is. Because in John 5, 39, Jesus makes the following declaration concerning himself. He says, John 5, 39, he says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and there are they which testify of me. The entire scriptures tell us about who God is. And therefore, since the people of God are to have the word of God abiding and living in them, it is to reveal in us, to the entire universe, who God is. If, that, who, if who God is is not being conveyed in our life, Therefore, the Word of God and the Spirit of God is not abiding in us, and therefore we need to be born again. It is for this reason we are to serve as co-laborers with God, and we must have the same intent and purpose as God has. The purpose of God was to reveal to the universe uh, who He is, and God has to do that same, has to complete His purpose in us to reveal to the entire universe, who he is. Continuing. There is no other way Satan can explain his own faultless righteousness up till the time he fell. And the familiar fearfulness of the angels who are still loyal to God than by arguing that obedience can be rendered only under limited favorable circumstances, facts which cannot be denied, he seeks to explain away. He is extremely skillful at this. Those who will fully enter into God's Sabbath rest must be familiar with his devices and know how to counter them. As the controversy over Job waxed hotter, Satan clarified his stand still further through his spokesman, Eliphaz, the, the Temanite, and his friends. Eliphaz claimed to have received his information by direct inspiration from God. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a little thereof. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof, and an image was before my eyes, there was silence, and I heard a voice saying, and this is Job 4, verses 12 to 16. Now, as interesting and as this account may seem, there is <coughs> something that we must pick up from this. 
He says, as the controversy over Joe Wax hotter, Satan clarified his stance still further through his spokesman, Eliphaz, the Temanite, and his friends. So it means that there is another group of people, just like Eliphaz, who believe that God is such a person as Eliphaz pointed out. And it is saying that for God's last day people, they must have an accurate understanding of God's character and what the controversy demands because they will echo the same sentiments that Eliphaz echoed. And we will actually be serving in the place of Eliphaz being the spokesperson of Satan. So therefore, uh, it is daily imperative that we understand uh, who God is and what the controversy demands. If not, we cannot truly serve in the capacity of Christ as his co-laborers and as those who are to reveal uh, and make known to the entire universe the manifold wisdom of God. And he says, Thus Eliphaz claimed to speak by inspiration. But it was satanic, not divine. God being the source, God denied being the source of his inspiration when at the end of the, the drama, he charged Eliphaz with speaking that which was not true regarding himself. If God was not the source, then certain, Satan certainly was. Thus, we can be assured that Eliphaz was Satan's agent when he said, Can mortal man be, made, be righteous before God? Can a, man be, be, can a man be pure before his maker? Even in his servants, he puts no trust, and his angels he charges with error, and another version says with folly. How much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. Now, praise the Lord, even though Eliphaz makes this statement, God does and will put his trust in those who dwell in houses of clay and whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. That is who we are. But praise God that the love of God, as John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, and we will be the ones to whom God will place his trust. And it's interesting that John uses the terminology of sons because um, in many places around the world, the government or a certain position that is held uh, by a father, these things are usually sent down to the son. And it is uh, this responsibility that is given to him. And God is actually saying to us through John that I have now uh, given, given you by inheritance the responsibility of making clear before the world who I am through your relationship with me. So uh, when it says sons of God, it does not uh, exclude daughters. All uh, men and women and children uh, can all be those who God will use to make known his wonderful character. He says the key elements and the charges level here is that God puts no trust in his servants or his angels. The great deceiver contends that God can only expect obedience from his subjects if he keeps them within a limited context. Outside of that, he cannot trust them to remain faithful to him. Thus, Satan sought to justify his own separation from God's government. And I just want to stop for a moment because if God cannot put his trust in his servants, then it is saying that God really did not give up. When God gave his, his complete self, he gave up everything. There was no uh, distress at all, because since the people of God are to fully reflect God in character, he cannot distress his people. He must, uh, that is an, the, uh, the aspect of love, uh, there is to be trust. If there is no trust between both God and his creation, uh, the relationship cannot work. There must be that mutual trust so that we can be effective co-laborers with God. So he says that the great deceiver contends that God can only expect obedience from his subjects if he keeps them within a limited context. Outside of that, he cannot trust them to remain faithful to him. And it is interesting, and it is very sad because I 
was um, taking this semester class in um, history of Middle East and uh, how it worked, especially within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, if you if you were the one who, because things were done by primogenitor, which means that the, the son, the firstborn son, would be the one who would then take the throne after the father has left. If you were the one who your father, if you were the one that your father chose to ascend to the throne, if there were any other siblings, they all had to be eliminated because they could be cursed. They had so uh, this was done quite often in the Ottoman Empire, uh, where brothers, unfortunately, and not to be graphic, but would have to have their brothers uh, eliminated by death, and this was the unfortunate. Uh, situation and therefore there was that limitation in which they had placed upon their brothers within the kingdom and sadly enough I think within one of the other empires uh, there was a father that did the same thing for his son because he thought his son was also a threat so but in God's government God's government is completely selfless and God gives all of himself regardless of what uh, may come his way. So Christ says, listen, I will give all, even if I am to die eternity. And it is amazing, the government of God, God who is abiding from eternity, creates beings in time, and is saying, if I have to die for them eternally, though I am responsible for their existence, I will die for them. That is how completely selfless, selfless God is. How can we reject such love? Such love which, though God who is infinite is saying that he will go so far as to die eternally for his creatures. And it is this love that is to inspire us and keep us in our submission to him. He continues, Thus Satan sought to justify his own separation from God's government. He argued that for untold millennium, God had withheld information which he could not trust him to know. And enlightened during that period, he had served God with undivided attention. However, once he had uncovered God's carefully guarded secrets, he was left with no option but to rebel. He then decided that the only possible course he could follow was to sever all connection with God while endeavoring in loving, self-sacrificing consideration for the still loyal angels to enlighten their minds to the real character of the deceiving, mistrustful God. He claimed that the only reason why the sinless angels that were still in heaven continued their allegiance was that they had not yet learned and would not be taught the real facts. They were still, Satan contended, in the context of prosperity and ignorance, where they will continue to keep the law, but let them be transferred to another situation such as that in which he now found himself and they would rebel just as he had. Now, Satan's course would have been correct if he had the evidence to support what he was uh, saying about God. But there was no evidence at all to support that God was a deceiving and a mistrustful person. And God had completely revealed himself to be uh, the, a revealer of truth and one who could be trusted. And Satan uh, brought these charges, not because God was such, but simply because of his the, the selfish heart that was developing in him for the want of worship to himself. And it is this character of infinite love that, and of selfless, the selfless nature of God that he wants to implant in us. So, and that to teach us completely of the government of sin and as the government of righteousness, so that we can make our choice to choose the government of righteousness over that of sin. And God has revealed completely what the government of righteousness really entails, and it, it really shows that the government of righteousness, which is the government of God, is the government which is absolutely selfless. And it is when this principle of selflessness is fully developed in God's people that uh, God can finally finish his work cut it short in righteousness. The people of God have really been holding on to what they want and not looking to see what the controversy demands. 
and as where we began in chapter, it says that if God had, um, he says, he says, full, per, full and permanent surrender to God as a plan maker involves the believer's total submission to whatever the everlasting Father in his infinite love and wisdom may elect to send or permit. Often that which the Lord allows his people to suffer is the opposite from that which they will plan for themselves. If God has said to the youthful Joseph, sit down and draw a plan for your service to me, he certainly would not have included a period of servitude in Egypt, followed by imprisonment in a foul dungeon. So God has to allow uh, these situations to occur and allow, and allow for us to understand that all that he's doing is for our best good and it is not at all to harm us, but it's actually to sanctify us and to make us as he is and to completely give up ourselves to him regardless of what he chooses. And where it is when we know Christ as he truly is, then we can trust him to guide us in a way wherever he sends us. And it was for this reason that Abraham could leave and go, and as Paul said in Hebrews 11, that God sent him even though he did not know uh, where he was going. And God is, is saying to us that it is when we know him as he really is that we can fully trust him. And it is these things that are brought to stake in the great controversy. When we know God as, it, as he truly is, then as Sister White says, we can truly render uh, that true obedience to him because we're obeying him because he is the God of love and he's not the one as Satan has depicted him to be. So I pray that we truly, especially at this time as God's people, see God for who he really is, understand what the controversy demands, and as the love of God is more perfectly re revealed to us every day, that we submit more and more to his perfect will. All right, so we're going to close at this time and I thank God through his Holy Spirit for the revelation of his perfect will to us, and I pray that we will truly surrender all to him for the accomplishment of his eternal purpose. All right. If there's no more questions or comments, we'll close at this time with a word of prayer. All right, let us pray. Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth as it is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for revealing yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ, revealing ultimately who you are, a God who is completely selfless, who would go so far to die for his creation. Father, may we truly uh, submit to you daily as we have a greater revelation of your character through your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we not at all uh, echo the sentiments of the enemy, uh, understanding now what the controversy demands, understanding who you are. May we submit completely to you, uh, regardless of the suffering or the tests and trials that we receive, understanding that you deal with us as sons and not as pastors, and that it is for our sanctification, for our cleansing. So be with us throughout the remainder of the night. May these truths be riveted in our mind so that we can be truly that last day people who represent you aright and speak uh, correctly concerning your character and your government. So be with us and abide in us and stay with us now we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. 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 In the words of our mouth, meditation of our heart, get acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I have a closing hymn. What's the hymn, Old Master? Let me walk with you. Oh, five seven four. 
Alright, M574, or Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. M574. Right. And the count of two. One, two. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee. In lonely paths of service free, tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me the slow on heart to move. My self-pairing in world of love, teach me the wayward feet to stay, and guide them in the homeward way. Teach me thy patience still with thee, in closer neighbor company, in work that keeps the sweet and strong, in trust that triumphs over wrong, in hope that sends a shining ray. Far down the future's morning way, in peace that only thou canst gain, with thee, O oh Master, let me live. Amen, and I pray that truly that uh, we walk with him as did the servants of all as did Job and Enoch, and they all came to understand who he was, and there was nothing that the Lord hid from them, and it was seen in their sanctification of character. So I pray the same blessing upon us.